We all know that data science and artificial intelligence is the one thing that at the moment is going to create the most um, unprecedented disruption in technology. There are benefits um, and there are a lot of unanswered questions. So today we're here to discuss some of these issues around underrepresentation of gender in data sets, bias in the training data, and the lack of women actually developing and deploying AI. The risk of, of, of these things going wrong um, is a lot more serious than in many other cases where there aren't enough women represented. This is a life or, or, or death situation, and we'll hear about that um, as we go through. It's a real unfair distribution of the benefits if we don't crack this today. So I'm so happy about all the people who are in this room, the people who have tweeted about this. There are a lot of people um, who you'll get to discuss with afterwards who aren't actually on the panel who are making headway in um, uh, bringing to light all of the different things that are going to actually uh, increase some of um, uh, the equality getting distributed more fairly. So what are the things um, that we can do? So I'm going to introduce you um, in a moment to the panelists um, so we can discuss um, and have a good understanding when we all go away um, at what we can um, action to make a real difference. Uh, uh, thanks for having me here. I guess I better get going because I have a ton of slides. Um, this is only the uh, second time I've ever done a, a sort of women in STEM type talk. And uh, the first time was much more academic, but I still found, I'm going to show you something that's slightly embarrassing to me, but all the women, and they were you know, successful, full professors, uh, were similar in this, which is how different, it's not simple, even if you're an academic, it's not that you just stay in school forever. Things are a little different. So I want to show you very quickly, you know, when I think about my life goals, I started out wanting to be underdog, but then I decided I wanted to be paleontologist when I was five. Uh, then I decided I wanted to be Jane Goodall, then I decided I wanted to be Spock, then I wanted to be John Lennon, then I wanted to be Yoko Ono, that was my feminist take. Um, there, there's uh, actually, there's a little bit of stuff running off the bottom here, sorry about this. So what I've actually done, <laughs> I thought PDF could not go wrong, but I was wrong. <laughs> anyway, so um, uh, when I was a 16-year-old uh, uh, to 20, I was a temporary. I worked in offices. Um, I also did a psychology degree, but I got as a tutor for computer science. That got me a job as a programmer. I was in the financial industry in Chicago on LaSalle Street. Anybody else from LaSalle Street? No, OK. <laughs> uh, then I was a grad student um, for a decade, which is more normal in America than here. But I also, during the middle, did some more consulting um, and contracting. And I worked for Lego, which was cool. Um, and then when I was 37 for one year, I was a postdoc in psychology. Then I became an assistant professor. Then I became a full professor, both in, our, in uh, computer science at Bath. So anyway, uh, we're, we're, yeah, I don't know how much is going to be a problem. The bottom half of the slides isn't showing. Uh, I did a PhD in systems AI. Uh, so what I was originally most known for was actually making it easier to make human-like intelligence. And this has particularly been, I developed it for human-like robots, but it was really taken up and has been quite influential in the games industry. I don't know if you guys know about behavior trees, but this was sort of some of that co co core technology. However, while I was doing that, um, well, I, I should say, yeah, what I really wanted to do, I forgot I had this thrown in, because this is new. What I really wanted to do was I wanted to be able to build scientific simulations. And uh, the, the thing that's got cut off down here is I did credit my uh, two co-authors. It's at the bottom, honest. Um, <laughs> but we just got into science uh, two weeks ago. So I, have, I actually have a science paper, which is going to come up again, because it's about semantics derived automatically from language corpora contain human-like biases, including gender biases. All right. So there's my co-authors, which you can't really see. However, when I was at MIT, one of the things I noticed, well, I couldn't help but notice, is people kept walking up to me and telling me how unethical it would be to unplug COG. COG was this robot that you see over there. It was, actually didn't work at all. It wasn't properly earthed the whole year and a half I was on it. They found that out after I left when they hired an electrician. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's MIT, right? But people would still walk by and say, it'd be unethical to unplug that. And I'd say, well, it's not plugged in. And they'd say, well, if you did plug it in, I'm like, well, it doesn't work. And I thought, what is going on? Why are people so sure they know what's going on about robots? Well, you know, you can guess, sci-fi, I don't know. Um, so the, I, I want to say this, this certainty that we need to extend the ethics that we've learned from humans into AI is disturbingly widespread. I mean, I did a special issue about this, actually, with this guy, despite the fact 
that he keeps criticizing my work, um, but, but we actually have known each other since before either of us were PhD students. And he, he, uh, he but, so I'm just picking on him, but you can go look at his 2012 book. But a lot of people say this. We, couldn't, we got like one paper that didn't say this, which is that we learned from feminism and we learned from the civil rights movement that things that you think are not people might be people, all right? If what you learned from feminism was that a robot is as much like a white male as a woman is like a white male, or that a person of color is as much like a, a white male, you really have not learned the lessons of feminism or of the civil rights movement. Humans have so much more in common with each other than machines have with humans. Just trust me on this, <laughs> okay? We could go, I could go on for hours explaining that to you, but I won't, I, because I have five minutes. So I got a lot of recognition by making the observation that since robots are servants we own, that's basically slaves. <laughs> and so then suddenly people started paying attention to the, the work I was doing, and then that got me into something. There are actually five principles of robotics. Um, but anyway, I, it was a, a group. The British are one of the only countries that have a national ethics policy about UK. This was our first policy. It was just sort of on a web page. Now there's a British standard for the ethical design of robotics. So the UK is really le leading here, but I would say it's being overtaken a bit by Europe. Europe is doing an extremely good job. They've already created about a, a bunch of legislation about data, and now they're moving separately into legislation about AI. Um, so as you may know, there's a, there's a white paper about that up, and, and it's the Euro European Commission's turn now. I don't want to, uh, uh, oh, this might be a problem. <laughs> So let me tell you very quickly about this, this paper that was just in science. Have you heard of the implicit association task? It's a way of measuring implicit bias. You can go find, like there's a web page on Harvard where you can click things and see how quickly you can associate different concepts. And it shows you that you have biases you really don't want to have, <laughs> right? Um, by, by how quickly you can associate things. For example, women with math and men with, uh, men, and men with, uh, sorry, women, yeah, go well, comparing women and men with math and writing, and you're going to find that you find some things easier to associate than the others, basically. And so this one is actually about uh, the gender bias stereotype, and you can't see the results, but the basically results are there's this giant effect of how much quick, more quick and easy it is to associate women with domestic stuff and men with career stuff than the other way around. And we showed the same thing using word embeddings, all right? Word embeddings are based on the distributed theory of semantics. It basically means that you can tell by how a word is used what it means. And the consequence of this is part of what these words mean, part of what the words, these are names, right? But part of what they mean is that they're likely to be going, for the girls' names, that they're more likely to be going into domestic arena than for the boys' names, okay? So those, that's in the words themselves, in the way that we, not we represent them, but this is, word embeddings are the things that make search engines work. So that's how you type in four words and get one of a trillion pages, for example. But this, the fact that we show this very similar, this great similarity between um, these well-known, well-established psychological results and what you could get using AI just by reading corp language off the text means maybe humans are doing the same thing. So maybe our implicit biases are showing that we've picked up on regularities just from hearing words, possibly. But the fact that that's even possible had long been debated, and we've shown it's possible because you can do it with a computer. All right, so that's what that paper's about. And then the scary thing, sorry, I'm, I'm slightly blowing over my five minutes probably, but on the bottom here is um, the percentage of workers. So the dots are representing different jobs, okay? And the bottom is the percentage of workers in occupations who are a woman. So starting with zero here to 100 over there. And, um, and unfortunately, programmers is one of these dots down here in the blue that's, that's not very many women anymore. Um, anyway, you can't see this. The, the y-axis is the same representations that gave us this, the, the, the match to the stereotype for psychology, give us a 90% accurate reflection of 2015 U.S. labor statistics. This shows, since the corporate we were using was the, it's the common crawl, it's, it's, it's a glove, it shows that, first of all, the web is heavily biased towards America, <laughs> the English language web, and what we already knew, it's heavily bi biased to the present, because every year we double the amount of text on it, or more, 
But, um, but this is very freaky because it indicates that some of the things that we're trying to fight when we fight stereotypes are actually facts, right? The same, that might be where, the, where some of these stereotypes are coming from is, is information, right? So that's really scary. Um, you can't entirely see this either. Uh, this is my fault for having ignored the, the, the uh, aspect ratio. I just assumed that the PDF would get stuck into it somehow. But anyway, <laughs> that, that, that red line there is how many programmers there were. And you can see that for the other sciences, it, you know, it's been a pretty steady increase, asymptotic at 50%, as we would expect. But something terrible happened around when I left. When I left programming, <laughs> like, <laughs> so I thought everything was fine. We were on this positive trajectory. And then that's why I was shocked when I did this paper, right? So I couldn't believe that. I'm going to say one last thing, which is that there's three possible sources of AI prejudice. One is evil, malign programmers. And we can't forget that. There may be people that are actually going and selling stuff to the government that has deliberately built-in biases. Okay, so don't forget that that's a possibility. One is the thing you usually hear about is the sloppy, possibly inadequately diversified programmers. But the reason I say possibly is with those implicit biases, we all have them. So even if you have a diversified workforce, you aren't guaranteed. Don't think that's enough. Because the other thing is just as culture correctly and directly learned Right? That's what machine learning is for. The best we can do is learn what humans have already figured out. So sorry for running over. No, that's good. Awesome. And now we're going to um, hear from Sandra. Thank you. That was terrifying, but brilliant. You have the clicker or the... I have the clicker. There we are. Hold that one. Okay. Yeah. Multitask. Hi. Uh, I'm Sandra Wachter. I'm a researcher in data ethics at the University of Oxford, and I'm a member of the Digital Ethics Lab, also at the University of Oxford. And I want to talk a bit about, um, I'm a lawyer training, um, and I want to talk about the regulatory approaches that we see in Europe to make um, algorithms more transparent and fair. And want to start a discussion of whether these approaches are sensible or not. So I want to focus on one specific topic that is really close to my heart. That is, um, if it, when AI is used in the job market, for example, AI is being used for hiring, firing decisions, and for promotions. And this is, has always been a big problem with regard to gender biases, obviously. And if we use algorithms to make decisions of whether or not somebody should get hired. Um, we have to make sure that these algorithms are designed in a way that don't replicate old biases. So if we think about hiring decisions, what is it that we want a, um, AI and algorithms to look like? We want them to be fair, accountable, and transparent. Um, there has been an ongoing discussion in the AI community of how we can actually achieve this goal. And one of those things that is increasingly coming up is the need to design systems that explain themselves when they make decisions. In Europe, uh, when we talk about explanations, we can think about maybe, maybe more, but two types of explanations that are possible. Either you can talk about an explanation of how an actual system works, so the basic description of how an algorithm works, or, and, you can think about the rationale behind an individual decision. For example, with the job application, why, in my case, what were specific circumstances why I did not or did get the job in the end. We do have discussions around this in Europe, and one of those myths that have been flying around is that we're going to have something that will come into force next year that is called the GDPR. The GDPR is the Europe's um, General Data Protection Regulation, which will come into force next year. And there has been an ongoing discussion whether or not the GDPR is going to do something in that relationship. Um, this is one quote that has been flying around in the media um, and government reports, um, and it's a bit misleading, and this is why I'm here to talk to you about that. I don't think that's actually going to happen in the way that it's presented, um, because it says that the GDPR will create effectively a right to explanation of automated decision, of all automated decisions that's being made about you, and you can ask for a discussion, uh, explanation about the rationale behind the specific decision. Um, we wrote a paper recently, um, Professor John Fleury from Oxford and Brent Middlestad from Oxford, um, and we analyzed the framework and tried to come up if that's actually going to be the case. And what we found, it's not all as it looks like. Um, just to give you 
an overview of papers pretty long, so I cannot go into detail. But what the GDPR will do is give you something that is better termed as a right to be informed. That means that you have the right to know whether or not automated decisions are being made about you, and you have the right to get an explanation of how the system actually functions to a certain degree. The degree yet is not clear. Um, and also, it will only apply if the automated processing is solely based on automated processing and only if the automated decision has legal or other significant effects. The discussion with the rationale behind an individual decision, that's a different story. That is not something that is yet legally mandated. Um, why do we think that? So this is just a legal, legal overview of the, of the important sections in the GDPR. And we do have something that talks about the right to explanation in Recital 71, which is a non-binding um, legal provision that gives some guidance on how to interpret the law. This could be used by judges in the future to actually establish something, but it's not legally mandated yet. So that is not a guarantee as it stands. The other thing that you can think about where discussion of the right to explanation could stem from is the right to access. The right to access means that everybody has the right to go to a data controller, somebody who is processing your personal data, and ask them, do you use um, data about me? And if you do, please tell me, um, what's, give me some meaningful information about the logic involved of, of the automated processing. Tell me about the significance of data processing and tell me about the consequences. If you look at the phrasing, this all points towards system functionality. So data controller has to tell you what are the purposes, what are the goals of the automated decision making. It does not really say anything about the rationale. Um, we strongly believe that this is only going to give you something about system functionality and why we do think this is because we went back. Um, because that thing is not a new thing. Um, this is also important to think. This, the whole discussion about the right to explanation has been established as something that is completely new. That thing has been around for 20 years already. So it's not really a groundbreaking new thing and it has not worked in practice so far. Uh, because in the old Data Protective Directive, we had something similar, the right to access, that would give you uh, the right to know something about the no knowledge of the logic involved. And we looked at how different member states implemented that. And we looked at court cases and legal jurisprudence and um, um, legal opinion. And they all interpreted it in a way that it is only about system functionality, not about the rationale. And when something about the system had to be disclosed, it was mainly heavily limited by trade secrets. And trade secrets that would include the algorithm, the method that is used, the weightings, the criteria, the code, the software, the reference groups. So this is a lot of information that actually limits, is actually very limiting when you talk about the right to explanation. Granted, this could be different in the future, but it has been seen as something that is really narrow. Other problems, I, I already touched upon that. It's really important to know that those rights will only kick in if the process is based on solely automated processing. So if you think about the hiring decision, if I use an algorithm and I only use it as an assistive tool to give me you know, um, a suggestion and the decision that I'm actually taking is made by me, that won't kick in because it's not solely automated anymore. The other question is, what are legal and other significant effects? Um, the framework does not really give a lot of guidance. It talks about online credit card applications and job recruitments, but what about other things? Algorithms are being used to decide whether or not somebody should be allowed to go to university. Algorithms can be used for funding applications. Is that a significant effect? That's not yet decided. And if it's not a significant effect, the safeguards won't kick in. And I think the most important question that we need to address, what is meant by meaningful information about the logic involved? Because as it stands, that's one of the most important things that could actually lead to a right to explanation in the future, if we want that, but it's not yet guaranteed. So, as I said, solutions as it stands right now, should the jurisprudence will define the scope of that right to access and other right of uh, explanations that we can envision, but it's not yet guaranteed. So we need to have a discussion now of what kind of explanation do we want and how we should design that. Um, we should also think about how to balance other interests because trade secrets and business interests of data controllers are also legitimate interests. How can we protect those whilst at the same time offering transparency and accountability to data subjects? And um, could we think about other things that have nothing to do with exp explanatory um, 
ex explanations. For example, what about auditing mechanisms that would flag up biases, for example, in the data set? What about certifications or seals prior to deployment of the algorithm that would make sure that the, the system is actually lawful? Or we could have additional member state laws. And again, this is where the UK is, is leading um, in Europe is because we just had um, the House of Commons public inquiry on automated decision making. Um, one of the first countries who actually think about new strategy to do that. And they talk about how we can, how we can make decisions more transparent and accountable and the discussion whether or not the GDPR's requirements are actually sufficient to do that. So I really much welcome the chance to talk about that because I think it's important that we discuss how we envision the future of AI in an accountable and transparent way. Thank you. Part of me dies from behind a podium. Um, where's the clicker? There we go. And just keep going, you'll, you'll be there. Yeah. That's me. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Maxi McIntosh. Uh, we're all clearly very data, data literate and pretty crap at timekeeping. I think we're all going to go a little bit over our five minutes. Um, where am I doing this? OK. So uh, my name is Maxine McIntosh. I'm a data science, trying to be a data science PhD. I mean, my second year morale is particularly low at the moment. And I spend my time trawling through medical records to see if we can find new predictors for dementia. And then in order to keep me sane, to keep you know, my supervisor and myself with a healthy relationship, I run a national network called One Health Tech. Um, and it's a network that looks to get more women working in health innovation. In, in 18 months, we got to 11,000 members in one year. So we're very pleased about that. So the, the title of this event is Why AI? And I have to say that I, would, I want to defer to our friend and colleague, Justin Trudeau, because it's 2016, 2017 now. And it's because, you know, it's not good enough just to say we need more women because we need to be apparently slightly more nuanced in uh, legitimising why diversity is an important topic. So um, you could come at this from so many different angles. So I thought I'd pick up on a couple of the ones that are a bit more personal to me. So I'm a kind of portfolio academic. I guess I would, I would epitomize the interdisciplinary data scientist. I did neuroscience, then I moved into health economics. Um, and then I decided to kind of merge macro modeling and neuroscience and fell into programming. And I have a huge thanks to the Women in Tech initiatives in London, um, because without them, I would have never transitioned into tech. I particularly like to name check Code First Girls for their efforts. Um, I then became completely obsessed with how we can ask new medical questions using big data. You know, we're not curing dementia with Petri dishes. How can we ask it from a completely different angle using this huge swathe of data we have at our fingertips? And as I said, I am the barometer for lots of disgruntled women trying to transition into technology from the healthcare sector. So I've got a pretty good idea of, of the kind of barriers that women are experiencing in this field. Now, Mean Girls kind of had it right when it came to communication. If you have sex, you will get chlamydia and you will die. And that's kind of the same with, with AI for me. You know, if you don't get enough women in AI, we will all die. You might think it's a bit dramatic, but I'm going to about to tell you why that is the case. So one, the under-recording of women in data sets. Women are underrepresented in some data sets. Solutions are therefore fit, not fit for women. Women die, humanity stops. <laughs> why is that? So um, one is clinical trials. So as we can see, we have our perfect specimen for clinical trials. This is your roughly 70 kg white male who looks rather healthy, probably in their mid twenties. And what racking abs. So this is the kind of gold standard for clinical trials. Because when you run clinical trials, you want to make your population as homogeneous as possible. So that when you apply a drug, you can really see what the effect is called, what the effect is. This is something called the efficacy of a drug. Now, then when you deploy it into the real world, that's called the effectiveness, which is basically what happens when you apply it to a much larger, much larger population. Now, the thing is that up until 2005, 80% of drugs in the US were removed from the market fully or temporarily because of adverse effects on women. That means that 80% of drugs that are deployed out into the real world were then removed because they were hurting and or killing women. That is unbelievable. So there's now been a number of different rules and regulations to kind of help encourage more women get into clinical trials, but it's very expensive to get women into clinical trials because we have periods mostly. Grr. 
I'm not going to give the example of medical schools too much, but basically this is a classic example of when you um, train a, uh, an algorithm to predict who's going to get into medical school, you can start to um, negatively select against some populations. St. George's um, uh, found that actually women were less likely to get into medical school, um, and that's what they suggested the fight, the, despite the fact that JAMA said women were um, better doctors, i.e. more people will die. <laughs> Number two, the open source community. Not enough women in the open source community. Women are better programmers, asterisk. Therefore, we create worse algorithms. Therefore, everyone dies. <laughs> so the open source community is really, really important for the development of data science and artificial intelligence as a field. It's this whole bottom-up crowdsourcing of ideas. Anyone who is a programmer here will know they spend 95% of their programming time on Stack Overflow. No matter what question you've asked, someone else on the internet has asked exactly the same question. Now, the open source community only has 11% women in it. And there was a really interesting study run by GitHub, which is like a code repository for, for all programmers in the world, it seems. And they found that women, by and large, had their code accepted much more frequently than men, but only when they didn't know that they were women. The moment their gender was revealed, they were less likely to have their code accepted. Ta-da! Ta-da! <laughs> also, the code that was... The, um, 25% of the programmers had 100% of their code accepted versus women, which is, which, versus men, which was only 13%, i.e. a quarter of the, of the women had perfect code every time, whereas only 12% of the men had perfect code every time. You could read into that, and I'm happy to talk to you about why that's not it's a bit of a dodgy result, but the point is that women, by and large, are better programmers in the open source community and are vastly underrepresented. The third point is this data science thing. So people are always like, gosh, Maxine, you don't look like a data scientist. I'm like, well, you don't look like a dick, but here we are. <laughs> now, uh, actually, I think that's ridiculous. I think that's ridiculous, because also Joanne and I both went for the garish shirt and suit combination. So clearly, this is the data science getup. But the point is that data science is a cross-cutting theme. By saying you are not a data scientist, you're basically saying, I don't um, base my professional work on information. Some of us work with larger data sets than others, fine, but pretty much everyone in this room will probably be a data scientist. You use data, you use information to make decisions. Data scientists are, are mathematicians, they're statisticians, they're AI specialists, they're programmers, but they're also visualizers, they're also business bods, whoever, <laughs> the other side of the world for me. You know, they're people who um, work with patients, they're people who communicate it. It's this cornucopia of skills. And I, by and large, women have a huge problem in saying, I'm technical or I'm a data scientist, and they'll shy away from some of the more technical roles. And actually, when you look into it, they're far more technical than most of the men in the room. So there's a bit of an identity crisis in what is it to be a data scientist. So to recap, if we don't have enough women in AI, the sector dies. If we don't have enough women in AI, women die. If we don't have enough women in AI, everyone dies. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Hi everybody, so I'm Silvia Chiappa, I work as a machine learning scientist at Google DeepMind and I try to create models there that can even be used by artificial agents to act and plan more um, efficiently. So uh, I would like to brought you your attention on the fact that, okay, we know that the uh, number of uh, women in science is much lower than the number of men. But for us, what is not completely clear is that there are huge differences between different countries. Now, if uh, biological differences between uh, men and women were the main reason or the only reason behind uh, gender gap, then we simply wouldn't see uh, vast differences between different countries. Uh, now, these uh, statistics that I show, uh, I hope you can see them, but basically, um, they show that in 2005, in um, academia, uh, the percentage of women in mathematics in uh, northern, uh, southern European countries such as Italy, uh, Spain and Portugal was much higher than in uh, northern European countries such as Germany, the UK or Sweden. 
Uh, there is a distinction made by um, uh, basically professor and uh, um, mathematician, that means here uh, lecturers and non-lecturer and uh, researchers. And we can see that the number of professors is much lower than mathematicians. And this indicates that there is a general problem of career progression from women, and this is common across Europe. However, uh, still, the fact that there are uh, differences uh, between different countries means really to me that um, Mm, the reason, the main reason behind gender uh, bias, uh, gender imbalance, is has to do with social cultural uh, factors. Um, and I can actually, uh, regarding to Italy, I can really um, uh, say that my experience uh, confirmed these uh, statistics here. I grew up in an environment that was quite um, neutral towards uh, women studying science and. Uh, Therefore, I was never encouraged or discouraged to study math at the university. And also, uh, I was brought up with the idea that I could switch from uh, humanities studies at high school to uh, mathematics. So I think it's important to create such an environment everywhere and actually to make it even better for uh, later uh, stages uh, in the women's uh, career. Um, now... Um, this is one point I wanted to try to make. The second one is, uh, okay, now uh, we don't only need to um, uh, improve gender um, imbalance, uh, but we also need to take carefully into account the bias in our data. And um, the um, way we can do that is, uh, for example, we can try to imbalance our data. In the case that Maxine discussed, when there are little number of women, we were trying to uh, get more women or we're trying to somehow um, <clears throat> modify our algorithms to uh, rebalance that. But in most cases, uh, we know it will not be possible to do that. And also there are cases um, in which we don't fully uh, understand the bias in our data. So uh, while each um, case and each uh, problem will be different, so that means that uh, each algorithm will require a different kind of approach to take into account bias, and therefore we cannot ask the research community to come up with an universal kind of solution. I think that we need um, the research community uh, to help to uh, establish a framework, a um, sound uh, theoretical framework that can uh, be uh, addressing bias um, in the uh, data. And the way to do that is to change the algorithms uh, to uh, have different objective function. Um, let me talk a little bit about that. Um, regarding to what has uh, been said before, um, there are already algorithms like that, uh, out there that try to uh, kind of uh, explain the rationale behind the decision. For example, there is a method called contribution propagation that uh, just makes it clear in a deep learning system which um, of the features were responsible for a particular decision. And this is extremely important. This has to do a lot with uh, transparency, how to make our algorithm uh, um, transparent and um, but uh, this can be used like this kind of approaches can be used to ask the question of if is it an algorithm um, bias uh, but ultimately this method cannot really um, make the algorithm uh, fair right so um, the approach actually to uh, make algorithm fair is really to change, as I said before, the objective function. And uh, there are uh, different types of biases. Um, I think that the, probably the most important and challenging uh, from a machine learning viewpoint is what is called historical bias. Uh, this is a kind of bias in which we have uh, attributes that seem um, unsensitive, but that are, um, and therefore, in which we can um, uh, base our decision system, but that are uh, influenced or correlated with the sensitive uh, one, with sensitive attribute. Let me give you an example. Like, suppose, um, that, uh, let's consider the uh, alone um, prediction problem, like we want to establish whether to give a loan or not. And as attribute, we might consider uh, past default data, and this seems um, a type of unsensitive attribute, but actually it might be that this attribute is correlated or influenced with, uh, for example, gender or race or nationality due to socioeconomical factor or to other uh, discrimination that happen 
in the past. Um, and so uh, in the moment, if we try to simply maximize the probability of a uh, loan to be replayed, then we will we'll end up with an optimal algorithm uh, that maximizes really um, a certain type of objective function. But this algorithm will not be uh, fair. We might think that this algorithm is not fair. Um, so um, in uh, terms of uh, um, working towards algorithm fairness, actually there are some interesting uh, literature that started to be uh, appearing like in the, the last couple of years. And um, this um, literature is trying to use the framework of uh, probabilistic modeling and causality. Uh, these two framework are framework, a statistical framework that enables you to reason with attributes and understand the relationship statistically and also to have some mathematical tool for um, understanding how causal, uh, causal connection uh, relates uh, to variables. And uh, these uh, two framework have been used already quite extensively uh, to address biases like in uh, uh, for example, forensics or uh, medicine or uh, other field, but um, uh, not necessarily to make algorithm fair. And what is new now in this last couple of years is that there are papers that uh, use this framework to change the objective function to make the algorithm uh, fair. And I think this, uh, the, the basic idea is um, to change the objective of the algorithm such that the decision made by the algorithm will not be, uh, will be independent on the sensitive attributes such as gender. In other words, if you change a sensitive attribute, then the algorithm will give you exactly the same answer. And I think this is an important piece of research. So far, these research has not been, uh, however, coupled with uh, deep learning, which is the most successful approach nowadays in AI. And I believe, I would like to conclude with that, that actually the really um, uh, main uh, progress and breakthrough will be seen when uh, we will be able to marry these two um, field together, deep learning with this uh, probabilistic and causal uh, um, way of uh, uh, reasoning. And, uh, or, and this concludes my, my presentation. Thank you. And Tracy. Hello everybody, Tracy Groves, delighted to be here this evening. I have to also congratulate Tabitha for such a diverse panel. I feel like I'm the last candidate. Well, yeah, congratulations. <laughs> I feel like I'm the last one on Britain's Got Talent and let's see if I can get the gold buzzer. Go on, go on, go on. <laughs> I've got the gold buzzer. Okay, I've got the gold buzzer because I've got no slides. So there we go. So I'm I'm the person standing between us and the, the questions. So um, my background, why am I here? Good question. I'm a partner at PwC um, and I lead our ethical business conduct practice. So I work with corporates to understand what doing the right thing means to them, both in financial services and non-financial services. Um, I'm also a music graduate, so that's probably maybe another distinctive element. I think there's many music graduates on the, uh, on the panel here. And there are two things that get me up in the morning. One is my alarm clock, um, which goes off far too early for me. And second is my passion for empowering and engaging people to want to do the right thing. So I work with companies in crisis, companies who find themselves at the receiving end of the law or regulation through to some event. That could be a whistleblowing allegation, it could be something that's happened that's triggered some kind of, of calamity in the, in the corporate world. And many times the organisation comes to me and they say, yeah, hands up, it's happened, but I don't understand why. Why has this happened? We are throwing the rule book at everybody. We're investing millions in compliance. Everybody's receiving online training, Tracy. Everyone's going through this mandatory exam at the end of it. I don't understand why people are still not making the right decision. And very simply, I think we've found ourselves, and this is you know, no blame to point at any individual, any individual organisation, we found ourselves in a position whereby we are just throwing more rules, more controls, more legislation in a world where actually we genuinely have lost sight of what doing the right thing is. 
Yeah, we've lost sight of... Oh, there's a clap there. <laughs> Not only for Tabitha. Yeah, and I, so my passion is about how can I help organisations think through this plethora of all the rules and legislation, understand what their vision and what their purpose is, what they stand for, and to really embed this. And actually, Joanna used the word right at the beginning. Actually, I'm an amateur psychologist stroke cultural change agent. That's really what I do for a living. So yes, I'm a chartered accountant. I'm a qualified practitioner when it comes to organisation design or change change management but I'm really there to help unlock the power of employees and leaders to think about why doing the right thing is good business and that's why ethics to me is so important so there are two things I wanted to share with you this evening apart from what I've said already but I'm very conscious of time the first thing is that culture can happen to you or you can make it happen so I very often get uh, CEOs and executive boards coming to me and say, Tracy, it's like a piece of jelly. Yeah, you throw culture at the wall and it slides down. How do you measure it? How do you test it? How do you assess it? And actually, I think that's a pretty lazy excuse. There are lots of things that we can do to change culture. Culture is localised. Culture is dynamic. Culture is something that we all create. We can feel it, we can smell it, we can hear it. So actually, what are the organisational policies and procedures that we can trigger, move, push and pull to change that culture? To create an environment where it's all right to say, I feel that I'm being discriminated against. That it's all right to say, I've looked at our gender pay gap analysis and I don't understand why the gap that we are in in 2017 exists and why it's going to take, I think I worked out I'll be 86 years of age by the time we get to equal pay um, from a gender pay gap analysis perspective. So I'm not hanging around that long yet. We haven't got time yet. As, uh, you know, as Maxine said, we'll all be dead by then. So really important to think about what we can do to address that inequality. And I know that when we look at women in our AI statistics, women in leadership roles, I think it's something about 20, 23%. You know, it's just not good enough when we know all the business case, all the stats out there that actually increase innovation, creativity, product growth, revenue, profitability comes through greater diversity of all respects, not just through gender, but that as well. The last thing I wanted to say to you was, in my spare time, I'm the co-chair of the PwC Gender Balance Network. Another reason why I'm, it gets me up in the morning, I suppose. It was the women's network and I ditched it. Okay, so I got asked to uh, take it on two, three years ago. And they said, Tracy, it's all your brand. It's what you stand for. It's about how you can unlock the talent of people, our female uh, staff within PwC, because we're struggling. Just like everyone else, we are struggling to reach 20% of females in our partnership um, on a global basis. And it's, it's just not good enough. No matter how hard we try, there's still a lot more work to do. And I ditched the Women's Network because I genuinely believe this is for men and women to come collaborate, to come together, to think about valuing difference. So just like we are all here on this panel, five or six white, to look at it, women on the panel, we're all actually extremely diverse and so different. And I genuinely believe that we can actually achieve more women in NI by valuing difference, by defining what we mean by that, by respecting that, and that ultimately will be doing the right thing. Thank you. So I hope there are a lot of good questions um, from the audience um, and that you're using slide IO in the way that it was intended. Um, so um, I'm going to start um, by asking a question that um, is probably why I got um, these awesome women together, um, which is uh, framed quite nicely, I think, Joanna, by your question around sloppiness. Um, and I feel um, the reason why I... I I made this evening about why do we need women in AI is because of Maxine's life or death situation, but also because is getting more women going to help us have less sloppiness? And I'm going to say something quite sexist. Um, I believe it is. Um, having more, more women who inherently are not 
um, sloppy and generally care. This is the panel that has prepped the most of any panel we've done in 46. Um, I can attest to that. Um, having more women in this game should be um, increasing our lack of sloppiness. So what I wanted to ask everybody individually was, um, how are we going to do that? How um, are we going to get more women into the um, into the, the deploying of AI and the having discussions around the building of AI? So less about the training data in this question, but more about how do we have more people like yourselves here in, in, uh, in 10 years' time. So I'm going to start with Joanna and we'll, we'll go round, and that will give you all some time to think up some questions that you, that you have as well. Okay. Um, I, well, I hate starting. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I do want to say that I know uh, I, it is a really interesting panel and it has been very diverse uh, in sort of the backgrounds, but I do want to acknowledge that this is a fantastically diverse audience and, and we don't reflect the full diversity of the audience. And, and so I think we, there's always room to grow. So I just want to say that. Um, the, how do you, how, the, there's a, there's a thing, you know, the Bechdel test for, for movies about there has to be at least two women who talk to each other about something other than a man. The Bechdel test for a panel is there has to be at least two women on the panel who talk to each other about something other than gender equality. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I, yeah, I'm not helping very much, am I? I you know, I, I think the most important thing is that we do things like this. I think this is super exciting, and I and and that we need to see each other and know that we get over this critical mass that we do actually have that it is part of our identity and that girls see us. I mean, what what people really want to know why is it that of the sciences that computer science fell off that way, and. Um, well, one of the old theories, I will, I'll even skip it because it doesn't make sense anymore. It was about access, the competitive access to scarce resources in the schools, but now pretty much they have computers, right? So that can't be it. The other one is the identity, that when you're in middle school, you care a lot about identity. And I think we, I would love to see kids not caring about what gender they are. <laughs> I would love to see that. I don't think that, you know, when we keep saying, do you, are you dressed appropriately for your gender and things like that, that is sending the wrong, the wrong message. But also that the computer games became a thing. Computers got identified with games, and the games got identified with violence, and it was just too far away. Um, there was a very uh, big, I think it was Google that did the study, that showed that um, it's actually men really support, fathers support their children fairly equally about going into computer science. It was the mothers that were letting down their daughters by not saying, that's a good job, go and be a programmer. And so I think we really need to reach out not only to, to preschoolers, but to moms. That moms need to see that it's cool to be a programmer and that that's a great thing for a girl to be. So um, yeah, I, I do think it's about what we see. Uh, well, I think that uh, one thing is very important uh, is to explain to young women what uh, machine learning and AI is about. Because I think it's more difficult for them to understand about uh, what the subject, this subject are really about. And I think it's more difficult than for, for young men. Um, and so there are many initiatives. And actually, some of these initiatives that we are doing at DeepMind, and I would like to actually um, explain some of them to you. For example, for the internet. National Women's Day, we invited 60 um, pupils, female, from several uh, schools, and uh, we explained them, uh, to them what it is uh, that we are doing at uh, the Mind, and um, have a panel and uh, we discussion from them. That's, that's one thing. We're also um, uh, collaborating uh, with InterScience uh, to start some uh, mentoring program for um, young represented young groups that's another initiative and uh, uh, another initiative we are doing is to um, uh, organize the summer school in uh, in South Africa that will have as goal yeah really to uh, include uh, different uh, type of people different uh, genders but also race and nationality these are uh, steps that are important and we are doing we uh, plan to do um, and I think uh, there are many other uh, of this type I think what is really lacking um, and uh, will be very important is to support women at later later stage in their career right we saw this uh, huge drop and uh, I think this is 
there is no much support in this sense. I don't know if you agree with that. Um, and I think that some possible step to take would be, for example, to have more flexible time for women or men that take uh, family. Um, for example, I have a crazy suggestion on having part-time work that uh, with the same salary. That's uh, I know it's uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a crazy suggestion at the moment, but uh, um, another uh, thing would be. Uh, Having on-site uh, childcare, I think I would see as uh, uh, really, really making a difference. And th there is some example here. For example, I was working in Tübingen, and there um, there is a woman, Christian um, Wollart, that got actually also the Nobel Prize. But she is trying to help women, and she's trying to help women with the foundation that support, especially women that have been um, uh, having uh, families, and so they are like uh, struggling uh, with uh, financial support, but also with on-site childcare, at least this is extremely important uh, to me, and uh, I like to see that in the future. They, um, and yeah, and a final point I would like to make, perhaps, is uh, that I think we should change our way, for example, of uh, thinking about promotion. So, if a woman work uh, part time, she uh, will probably uh, need a kind of more tailored type of um, uh, path for promotion. And I conclude here. That's awesome. Thank you, Pastor Tracy. Okay, so just to recap the question, how are we actually going to get more women into doing this? How can we get more women into NI? Well, yeah, we don't know. if we all knew that, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> but we, uh, yeah, exactly what we're here. Um, I'm going to actually quote from a, a piece of research which I won't be able to claim fame for. It's called Winning the Fight for Female Talent. And we did this piece of research uh, to celebrate International Women's Day this year. And it's how to gain the diversity edge through inclusive recruitment. And I think the word inclusive is the key thing here. We know that nearly 80% of CEOs that we survey as part of our global CEO survey say that they are looking to attract more female talent into their organizations. So we chose the word fight for female talent really specifically. This is a fantastic opportunity. I don't see this as a barrier or a challenge. I think the world is our oyster. This is all about how we can bring the best of ourselves into the AI world as women. We know that what women want in the workplace is career opportunities opportunities for progression. So I am ambitious as a woman. I want to progress. I want to be recognised for my talent. Let me have a fair and open opportunity to do that. Secondly, I want an environment where I am seen to be rewarded on a fair and equitable basis. So I'm competitive. What is wrong with that? So it's about not seeking or being apologetic about being um, what I would consider, I use the word ambitious, many women don't. So women have actually stated that they want that. And the third and final thing, which I think we've touched upon already, is about making this more inclusive. So valuing difference, which means that we can have flexibility, both men and women want this. This is not gender uh, stereotypical women, it's actually gender agnostic. So I think the sooner we can start to talk about this for all of us, as opposed to just for women, the better position we'll be in. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I think I will close. I will say something similar that Joanna said because I think that's that's one of the important things we need to focus on is visibility, and to show young women and girls who are the actual women that are doing this kind of stuff um, that you actually have a face to to those people and don't always imagine you know other people doing that. I I have to say I've been pretty lucky in that regard because my my grandmother, for example, she was one of the first women that was admitted to Techno University in Austria. She, with uh, three other women, was uh, the first one that ever studied there and graduated from there. So that was my role model. So I never, I was blessed to have that role model. So I never really had the same, you know, for, for me, it was always clear that gender is not a problem in tech at all. But I, I know that that's not the same case for everyone. So I think um, events like this, where you can actually see the women that doing that kind of work and empowering uh, women and inspiring women, that's a really important thing. And another thing that you said is, is, is really important. You, you said you don't look a, like a data scientist, right? I, I think we need to move to to an to image where when you say, what does a data scientist look like? You only have a mind. You only think about a mind, not a gender, not a person, not a background, nothing. It's just a mind that is doing the work. And this is the way that we need to approach this, I guess. So, so I guess I kind of centre it back on the AI bit. I suppose I've got two points. One, uh, when people say, gosh, you're a data scientist, you must be amazing at maths or statistics. I'm like, no, I'm super shit at maths, actually. I'm amazing at Latin, though. 
So I did Latin for 12 years of my life, and I have to say Latin was the most analogous thing to programming, much more than statistics or maths. My, math, my Latin class was 90% female. So I think there's an element of actually kind of reframing what programming is, what, what data science is, what this whole field is, to elements that are, by and large, more represented by women. So I think that's, that's one point. And secondly, it's that point I made about data science being this journey you know, I don't get 12 million patient records and get really worried about how the data is collected. That's someone else's problem. And so when I do my research and I put it in front of a statistician, he rips it apart and says, like, this is awful, your statistics is crap. I go home, lick my wounds, try again. Put it in front of a computer scientist, they rip it apart, say this is crap. Because they're all approaching it from their own discipline angle. You put it in front of an anthropologist, they'll do a completely different analysis as well. And so it's about exposing the whole data science journey to a whole slew of different disciplines because they will challenge it and readdress it and make you rethink it in ways that you could never imagine. And yeah, okay, it's you, know, you kind of have to keep on getting up and think, I'm not crap, I'm not crap. But that is, I think, what the best way is to create incredible algorithms and incredible analyses. Thank you. So I said that I would only um, ask people to read out their own questions, but Anonymous has got a question that's been upvoted seven times, so I'm going to read it out for them. That's the last Anonymous... Oh, well, then you're allowed, Sharma. But I forgot to write my name. So. Please. Hello, I'm Sharma Dean. Um, so we always talk about diversity as being a male, female, or a race thing, but I really think lower socioeconomic backgrounds is really important to the conversation also because I grew up from a single parent family in Wolverhampton but I was just very smart and if it wasn't for my teacher at school forcing me to go to a school my mum wouldn't have sent me don't know my dad if it wasn't for my teacher I probably wouldn't be where I am now so we can't necessarily rely on the one teacher to like push that kid through so how can we actually get whether it's white black male or female but you know, different income backgrounds contributing to the conversation because they have a whole host of problems that we don't even know about. So a lot of the AI applications we're talking about today tend to be for university applications, loan applications. You don't do that if you're from the hood. <laughs> do you know what I mean? There are other problems you have. So I think that that's an important voice to be heard as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. <laughs> Maxine, do you want to have a go at answering some of it? And then we'll pass to Tracy as well from the uh, corporate standpoint. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, both my parents, scientists from Cambridge, what was Maxine going to do? Obviously, she was going to be a scientist. You know, <laughs> that is enormous privilege. Um, and I think that's something that we all need to be aware of. I think that's an absolutely fantastic question. I guess my, my, my comment on that would be, it's kind of the, the latent variable point. It's like an onion. You know, and then you've got three big layers on the outside. And I think the ones that are most determinant of how you behave in a professional environment is your age, your gender, and your socioeconomic status. And obviously, like things like your SES are quite correlated with things like race according to where you are. But those are the three biggest determinants of how you behave pressure, professionally. And it's all well and good us talking about ageism and, and gender here. Um, I think from the tech perspective, it's got a lot of money pumped in, pumping into it that is reducing by and large, the cost barrier to some of these things. So actually, if you look at the women in tech agenda in London, overwhelmingly, it's free because they realise actually that's the best way to get women into stuff. Um, I don't think that has necessarily trickled down. Um, I know that programming is now going on the national curriculum and that's going to help kind of um, lift up those who are from kind of low socioeconomic status. But I do think the tech world is aware that the best way to get these groups not involved is to cut the cost completely. And that is, you are, you are starting to see some effects. Mm. But in terms of the problems we're working on, I totally agree. Yeah, it's, it's really important. And Tracy, how, um, how would you advise a company who was trying to address that? Again, I think it's a, a fantastic question. I, I genuinely think there is a role for corporates to play here. And a number of corporates are doing a lot to increase social mobility and to get younger people who aren't from such privileged backgrounds through apprenticeship schemes, for example. That's becoming very much more, uh, I think, a very um, favourable and positive platform. I think there's also the thing in terms of the, you mentioned the university applications and UCA points and what that means. And all, all these barriers come down straight away. There is a move now towards the more enlightening corporates who are removing those for example so we don't judge those applicants that come in the door at PwC we don't score them against the UCA points so there is absolutely going back to what doing the right thing is living your purpose and your values that extends towards bringing in talent and potential because of giving people that opportunity and what we can do I just very quickly wanted to share a story with you um, as part of my job that I um, which I love doing with the gender balance network um, I invited some of my clients corporate clients big FTSE 100 uh, heads of 
compliance and risk to the PwC pantomime. Okay, so this is an annual thing that we do every single year. We do it in London and Western Theatre, and we do it in a region as well every year. And I think it was um, Puss in Boots we did this year. And as part of the opportunity about valuing difference and inclusion, I invited my clients and their families to this event this one night. And PwC Panto is run by PwC staff, partners, costumes, music, words, choreography, music, everything is done by employees in their time that we give them in order to put this on we run it 25 nights per year it's for disadvantaged children and for people who are um, in adolescence who are experiencing behavioral challenges and problems and one client came to me the next day she rang me and she said I have more respect for PwC because what I observed and felt last night in that West End theatre than all the you know, thought leadership, collateral, research, service, all that kind of thing. This is what you stand for as a firm. You are giving joy in those audiences' lives. And I was so, it was very, very moving. And it, I think that connection to me is really important. Um, so I think the more we can value that difference and seem to be as a force for good, the sooner we'll get towards equality in that respect. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Jana. I, I actually sort of sort of feeds into the question and sort of feeds into what Max has already said. Um, that uh, it, programming is something that you can do that's fun, that you can do on relatively low cost hardware. We don't have to emphasize that. And, we, and that everybody, it's a creative act. It's something that we should, uh, yeah, reach out with. And it's, it's not... Um, yeah, it, you're right. It's not. It's not necessarily like math or whatever. It's not necessarily that you really need this huge education to get to the point where you could be building cool things that actually get stuff done. And actually, one of the interesting things that, um, I, well, again, I, I hate to keep mentioning, but there's some people who do a lot of the AI. Google is doing is trying to make machine learning just a part of an ordinary library that you would so you don't have to be somebody who writes it from scratch. That you could just have access to it. And so I think in a way, uh, thinking about those sorts of things, about how to make AI accessible and something that kids are developing uh, in, in, in early, you know, not just in secondary, but even you know, in, in primary education, that might be one way that we could uh, widen, widen uh, both yeah, the diversity, because you're right, it's all diversity, it isn't just gender diversity, it's easy to pick one. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to throw it open to um, the floor again. So Celia Tilly from Benevolent AI. Yeah, perfect. Can I pass you the mic? Hi. Um, thank you all for your contributions. They were great. Um, so maybe I should say a little bit about my background. I studied in philosophy, then moved to cognitive science, and now I'm working in artificial intelligence. I, I know a couple of people from that, from my pe previous background as philosophy of AI. Um, junkie. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I care a lot about cognitive biases because of my background, and I totally take this point. And I think it was great to know about this thing about word embeddings. So, how do we deal with the biases in the data if they are so embedded in the data? as they are embedded in our own minds. How do we, I mean, because if you create the data, then of course you're going to reintroduce whatever biases you have. Right. So I kind of, I wrote the question before Sylvia uh, gave her presentation, so she gave a take on that. But now I'm thinking word embeddings. I mean, I kind of go and curate, you know, like the billions yeah. of, you know, sentences that are out there. So do we stop doing machine learning? Uh, yeah. What do we do? Oh, well, yeah. Second, just oh. okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'd love to talk, but go ahead and start because I've done this a lot. So um. <laughs> people are all. No, I was just wanted to say that actually on that particular word embedding problem, there is already some research done to uh, correct partially the problem. Um, so there are some paper out that, that tackle this problem. Of course, as you say, uh, what do we do? Do we stop doing? And I think this is a very uh, tricky question, and that's. Uh, we are not, as I said uh, in my presentation, very aware of all the biases, so uh, I think it's, there is a lot of research to do and I don't necessarily have all the questions uh, now, but um, I'm confident that we can progress from, uh, from where we are now. Okay. I, uh, I, yeah, so there was another paper that hit archive about the same time that did 
that supposedly uh, de-biased the word embeddings, again, only for gender. And, and it took an enormous effort. And what you're doing then is you're misrepresenting the world. So you're reducing, first of all, you're reducing how well you understand what people are saying. And secondly, someone has to choose what the world should look like if you're actually warping those representations. So you're giving a lot of power to someone. So my author team has said, no, we should not go in and change the word embeddings, at least not directly. What I keep saying when people ask me this question is, look, this is no better and no worse. It is no more or less frightening than the fact that our children are being exposed to this, right? So if we want to make it better, the, the word embeddings better, we have to make our society better. And so the things we're talking about now is one way to get to that. What you need to worry about, of course, then is both for humans, and this was published as cognitive science. This was not published as artificial intelligence, right? So both for word embeddings uh, and, for, and for the real world is um, given that we know that there, that there is going to be this distorted thing, this thing distorted by the past. And I want to point out one of the things that we didn't do in our, in our study, but that has been shown by the people who study implicit bias, is that it's easier to associate right with good than left with bad. Okay, so even though there's a long history of people thinking of left as the bad side or whatever, nobody thinks that's a fact. So we're not talking about facts here, even though I, I showed there was a fact about distributions of jobs. But, um, oh, I'm sorry, I slightly lost the thread there because I was thinking about that point. Uh, but my point is, oh, I know my point. My point is that humans, we bootstrap that way. We, maybe we learn that's our meanings from hearing how people use words. But then we negotiate, right? So we have an explicit as well as an implicit memory. And we can make decisions, one-shot decisions, and we can come to negotiate solutions that benefit more people than historically we were able to benefit. And so I think that's also really important for our AI systems that we need to have, you know, we need to have uh, modularized things and we need to know that sometimes we're gonna have to, if, if we train the system from culture, then it shouldn't just act directly without having another filter pass as we do. We need to sort of, if we're going to train it that way, then if it's going to act, we would prefer to have it have like a politeness filter of some form. Yeah. It's worth adding that there's obviously a plethora of statistical techniques to, to deal with a whole load of different biases, and that's like a very common thing to be doing in statistics, look at biases. Um, I guess what I would say is that the, the standard of data analysis that happens in the commercial world versus the academic world is obviously a different standard of rigorosity. Um, you know, I really commend organisations like DeepMind that publish Okay, we still don't know everything that's going on, but they do publish. And I think it's very important to encourage open publishing in AI because the replicability, the replicability is the important thing. Everyone's going to have different biases, but if you replicate it to your best, you know, to your, your best way, you're going to pull up, pull up where those biases have, have been if you're replicating other people's studies. So I think a big thing would be to encourage everyone working in this area to publish aggressively. Nice. Yeah, perhaps I, I wanted to uh, conclude saying that um, indeed I think that the word, this solution to word embedding is not the ultimate solution. Like we find some uh, problems with that. And that comes back to the problem I was saying before. Uh, it's not possible to give an, an universal solution. And I think the critical point will be that we need to make sure that we will have um, a regulation, strong regulation that will enable to use AI technology only if it's fair. And that really will depend on case to case um, and we can't find the solution but uh, what I was trying to uh, point out is what we can do is to go ahead and uh, develop framework that can be then specialized to specific uh, uh, problems. Okay, awesome. Um, next Guy Gadney. So Guy Gadney, awesome. Both not made them very easy, have we? So. Hello. Um, sorry, I was standing at the back there. Um, so my question was that we, uh, I got Amazon Alexa because it was really good fun. We thought it was. And in our household, <clears throat> after about a week, we removed it because <clears throat> we found that everyone was, that it was teaching uh, us and my two small boys to shout uh, at a woman. And it started to really irritate me that Amazon could have made some really clear decisions there. They could have called it Alex, mm. <clears throat> saved on typeface. Right. <laughs> uh, 
they could have made it so that we could choose whether it was a woman or a man that we were talking to, mm. or gender neutral. And as someone who's building these sorts of characters and personalities using AI at the moment, I just want to get the sense of the panel, you know, you're building a lot of the tech that sits behind it, but how are you looking at how that surfaces and what our interface is and how that can start to teach people um, as these personalities become more mainstream? Yeah, it's a really good question. I'm going to let the practitioners tell you the answer, but I'm going to tell you a very small answer from a uh, home-owning Alexa. Uh, I, uh, I actually told my boyfriend and my family that I'd tr coded, I can't code, I'd coded Alexa to only take um, uh, commands if they said please and thank you. So now uh, everyone's very, very polite um, to Alexa. But I don't know how long it works, and I think your point is um, a very, very important one. So um, should we start with Joanna? Yeah. Because I've tweeted heavily about this as well, and I thought your question was brilliant, is that the consumer-facing products for AI, like Alexa, Siri, et cetera, they're all female voices. Even Peg from Sage, um, Peg is a woman. Clara, who I love that company um, that Marin Nelson has, but why is Clara a girl? It just teaches this subservient like ask a woman to do stuff and she does it and my son who you may have just seen running there is a massive Alexa fan and he just yeah exactly the same shouts Alexa this Alexa that and I'm like don't shout at me like that because <laughs> it doesn't fly in this house so I think if women are building these products they're not always going to be like female subservient products and Unlike the work that this panel have been doing, they're the consumer phase in the first entry point for the general public. So it's actually a massive issue. Really dangerous. Sorry, the people that really need to work. Um, I, know, I know the person who uh, was part of building Alexa, um, and there were a lot of women there. And the only reason why they chose Alexa was just because the domain was available. <laughs> Um, so, so please don't don't be too harsh on them. Sometimes it just happens. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't think that they really wanted that to happen. Unfortunately, it just happened. Um, Joanna, tell right. us what you think we can do. So I want. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Joanna, right. help us. Okay. Tell us what we're going to do I would next. like to, uh, uh, one of my uh, bullet points that got cut off there, the, the fourth principle of, uh, the fourth EPSRC principle of robotics is to avoid human likeness altogether. So we shouldn't even be having this conversation about gender. True. Uh, there's somebody named Roger Moore, who's a professor of voice speech and synthesis. He's always argued that we should make it clear that it's robotic speech. Now, it's unfortunate that people find, of course we find other humans attractive. I mean, we're monkeys. Monkeys find monkeys attractive too, right? We all are like that. But the point is sometimes you have to make a decision about what's appropriate, as I, I admire you for doing in your household. Um, but companies should be doing the same things. If we over-anthropomorphize our artificial intelligence, then people have incorrect expectations about it. And one of the expectations that I don't like about these, these home domestic assistant things is that it's going to be like a friend, right? It's sold like a friend. There is something listening to your household and uploading it all into a cloud of unknown cybersecurity. Believe me, the best organizations in the world, like banks and, and governments, are failing to stop hackers. And you're letting your family's conversations to each other and the, and the kids thinking of it like it's a friend or it's another thing or whatever. You're exposing that, to your family, to that? I just find it bizarre. Okay, So robots are not your friends. They're technology that is an extension of corporations, right? And the corporations, the pieces of software, they're not, no one company, no one company is writing all the software they use. There's libraries that are coming out from who knows where, all right? So the, the less we anthropomorphize the AI, the better off we are. It does make the, the a learning curve, you know, it does, it does reduce some of the attractiveness of selling something, but there's all kinds of problems with anthropomorphized AI. And gender is only one. Really, really important. Um, I'm going to take us on a more positive note. Mona at Rathbones. Where's Mona? Awesome. Um, 
I need more mics. Or more. Hi, right, thank you so much um, for the fascinating evening. I'm, I feel super informed, but I'm starting to get a little sad. Please, can you lift me up with some um, positive anecdotes of maybe things that people are trying that are working or look like they might be working to address the imbalance? I'll just say something really fast. I know I'm talking too much, but there are more women when you do AI. It's partly because it's close to psychology. But I, you see a lot of women in humanoid robotics. I just said not to do humanoid AI. But anyway, there's a lot of women in humanoid robotics, and there's a lot of women in AI generally. So, so I don't know if that makes you feel better. But I think AI may help bring women into programming. It may work but that direction. Have we got a good case study, Maxine? Positivity and, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess I'll, the healthcare is a really the healthcare one's a very good example. Um, you know, you would you wouldn't think that healthcare has a, a gender problem given the fact that seventy seven percent of the NHS are female, um, but health technology has you know quite low representation, it's still around twenty five percent. Um, so it's not it's higher than the average um, in technology, but still not the best. Um, and I guess you know by the nature of its healthcare, you've got more women working in the fields and. Machine learning and artificial intelligence is doing insanely good things in healthcare. I mean, I would like you to not read the papers it's kind of slandering Watson and DeepMind. I mean, without a, a really open view about what huge data sets can do, if we have a slightly healthier attitude to what we do with our data, we can really save lives. Hashtag data saves lives. It's the best hashtag on the internet. Um, and I think that, you know, when we look at those sorts of areas and you look at the fact that there are many more women working in health informatics and you've got incredible things like, um, you know, Mount Sinai in New York, they identified that we don't, we've misunderstood type 2 diabetes thanks to basically some quite basic clustering analysis. They identified three subtypes of type 2 diabetes, which translates to we've been looking at type 2 diabetes in completely the incorrect way. So it's a few things like that that, you, that, that if, we, if we start to answer questions in a more intelligent way, we use data in a more intelligent way, and something like healthcare that has more women than other parts of AI, like that's a really fantastic thing. So using healthcare and health informatics as a case study, I think is a very good way of trickling down. You know, more women in healthcare using AI saving lives. No one dies. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I think want to say something similar. I think we should not forget that AI could actually help us make better decisions than humans. I think that's just something that gets lost in, in the discussion because with the technology itself, you can actually find out when the technology is biased because of the training data and then actively act against that. With humans, we don't really know what they're actually thinking. They could lie, they could deceive us. Technology is not inherently designed to do that. So it gives us an opportunity to make less biased and less discriminatory decisions that humans would actually be able to do. So there's a, a great opportunity to make the world fairer than it is right now. Of course, please. Stand up. Hi, as you were looking for... Hi, my name's uh, Nivena and I just wanted to um, share with you something positive that our company is doing. So they introduced six months paternity leave. Awesome. That is the equal one with maternity leave. And us too. Us too. Which is a? D digital studio. Ooh, we should, um, we should uh, at some point. Paternity leave. Awesome. Nice work. It's, it's worth adding, that actually, the first hurdle in this is awareness. I mean, you know, it, I'm thrilled to see quite so many men in this room. Um, you know, obviously, overwhelmingly female, great. Um, but, you know, if there are more men working in AI, the fact that men are aware that these things exist, is, you know, that's most of the battle there. So everyone go tell your male colleagues, because they're the ones writing the code, tell your, your male colleagues to come to things like this, because awareness is the first hurdle. And once you've got that, it's a much easier ride there afterwards. I agree. And, um, Julia, we've got one more positive from Kim at Pivigo, please. Thank you. Um, so I, I was sharing with Tabitha earlier today that we are just today launching a campaign called I'm a Data Scientist. So we now have a website called imadatascientist.com or it could also be I'm mad at a scientist if you prefer that. Um, but basically we're just trying to celebrate um, diversity in, in data science. It is about gender but it's also about um, 
older people who want to become data scientists and people from different nationalities, etc. So please do visit our website and um, hashtag I'm a data scientist and nominate three other people to also be proud and say they are a data scientist as well. I did have a question as well, which is around, for our, for our data science training program, we've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people. And a key problem we found was that on average, we scored the women lower, which was really shocking for us to find out because it was actually women interviewing women and men. And we were really shocked to find out. And we had to do a bit of soul searching, of course, and find out what's going on. And the only thing we could think of was that the women were much less confident in their interviews. Uh, and, and instead of saying, yeah, I want to be a data scientist, I can do this, I've got all the skills I need, they would say things like, well, I think I might be able to do this, I think I might enjoy it, um, and please give me a place, and things like that. And of course, we're trained to look for people who are confident. We want to work together with people who are confident. So how do we build confidence in young women, girls and women, to go into these careers, and also not just go into the career in the first place, but then go out and share it with the world at events like this, and talk about it, and drive innovation, and present at conferences, and really be bold to stand up and talk about it. How, how can we build that confidence? I think that's the great question to ask about confidence, and, and often I do question about this um, because it's easy to say women lack confidence, therefore it's applied to all of us. And, and I do think that can be a default position, but not necessarily so. I would say that um, the role of role models or real models as opposed to role models is really key. And what I mean by that is not these high-flying women who have got a nanny, a housekeeper, you know, f five members of staff at home doing the ironing, you know, these are women who are juggling families, other halves, you know, children, whatever it might be, but real women who have made some hard choices and decisions in their life. They give so much confidence and empower younger generations. And a, a key thing that I see, there was a, a research done by Business in the Community called Project 28 to 40. So it's targeted at women 28 to 40 about how they articulate ambition, about confidence, uh, and about um, their passion for what they do. Uh, could men were also asked if they wanted to to respond as a kind of control feature and actually the synergy between men and women about confidence was really striking they're just better at covering it up so I genuinely think that we could actually learn a lot. This is all again about, I keep on going about men and women working together. Men can be advocates, they can be sponsors, they have a role to play. They genuinely, and most of them, when they realise they've got a daughter and they actually, you know, gosh, you're saying that my girl won't have the same opportunities as everybody else. That's not fair. Hey, get over it, you know? We've been living with this the rest of, you know, for ages. It's, it's about making that connection about how we, all of us can benefit by doing that. So part of me believes, yes, confidence is thing but I wouldn't want to use that again as a sloppy or a lazy excuse all of us have this fear gremlin insider saying we're going to get found out yeah even the most even, you know even the most highly ambitious and probably successful woman is probably going to scared about found out this is about self-belief it's about knowing that you're good at what you do and it's also about operating in an environment whereby you're given the opportunity to demonstrate your full potential Awesome. There's, there's someone in the audience, and then I'll come back to the panel, who uh, might have an answer to this question for us, who I asked to come down um, this evening. So go ahead. Oh, hi. Um, so I'm the founder of Women With Voices, and I work a lot with women in tech to help them to find their voices and to express that. Um, also on a Saturday, I help out at a Saturday school with little young children. And sometimes when I hear these, um, this talk about, you know, we've got to get more women in tech and et cetera, et cetera. I also think that we really underestimate the juggernaut we're up against. You know, stereotyping is so huge. We have little girls from age six saying things like they don't want to be smart anymore. Um, there's research that shows that um, we, we, we're, we're born passive almost with um, adverts, with, um, you know, the, the fairy tales. We've got to be, you know, prince to rescue us. If you Google girls for toys for girls, it's pink, it's passive. It goes back to so young. Um, and stereotype sells, you know, it sells plastic surgery, it sells makeup, it sells clothes. And we're so impacted on a daily basis. Sometimes I think we underestimate what we're up against if we could first of all just realize that that you know but don't beat yourself up it's difficult okay you're almost having to reverse a lot of your thinking going back many many years um and also for me i think we almost need to stop talking about 
men, um, women, and, and separating it. We are just human beings. And if we, if we take that away, take all the, the gender stuff away, remember that we're human beings, and we can all achieve everything if we correct our mindset. We set a goal and we put strategies in place to achieve that. But once again, like I said, do not underestimate. Don't, don't beat yourselves up. Every day we are bombarded with messages that tells us that we're just not good enough. Um, it, it's a big battle. But if we start with awareness, like they've said, it's a start. Joanna, and then Sylvia, how are we going to do that? And then are we going to have our last... Okay. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be slightly contrary as I was a little bit before, which is that um, there's, a well, there's a fairly well-known in psychology result that men tend to overestimate their abilities and women tend to underestimate their abilities. Now, uh, you, maybe, maybe that's because we've been enculturated that way, but um, as Maxine was talking about before, it's well known that medicines work differently on men and women. Men and women are just different. And so my, my response, actually, I heard somebody give that as a talk. At, I, I'm at the Center for Information Technology Policy at Princeton. Someone gave that point as a talk and said, so what we should take away from that thing about men overestimating themselves and women underestimating themselves is that if you're ever on a boat that sinks and you think you could make it to this island, you might be wrong. And I'm like, nothing happened. And I finally said, unless you're a woman. And he's like, oh, yeah. You know, I, how could he not even be mortified by that? That there was more women than men at the table in that room, and he didn't think, go for it, go for the island, because more, for most people in that room, they should go for the island, right? So uh, my point is only that maybe you should think not only about changing the confidence of, of women, but maybe you should think about changing the way you interview to, to value other things than, than uh, overconfidence. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I totally agree with that. Actually, I wanted to make exactly the same point. <laughs> we should uh, perhaps, yeah, look at other uh, qualities. And uh, um, I would also say that, yeah, being too much confident sometimes can be counterproductive, especially in um, in research. Uh, there are um, so doubting yourself or <laughs> is is also uh, quite important for for doing good research. So we or yeah, playing a, a useful role. So we should uh, really perhaps also think about that when we interview. Awesome, Max. You're a very attractive crowd, right? So I would give you all a task to go to your local school and then go to the next shittest local school and all give a talk there about why you love technology. You are young, attractive, probably vibrant, um, fun people, I'm sure. And it is, makes such a big difference if you go and do that. So I used to spend a lot of my time going to talk schools and realise I've got to do a PhD at some point. Um, so if you tell all your friends and you make an actively reach out to your school, it makes such a big difference. Um, I actually may now make a point of going to, you know, by and large boys schools and stand up as a woman in front of boys and that's now my personal thing so you can it can manifest in any different ways but that's a way, you know something you can walk away from this event saying i'm going to go to my local school and talk about why technology is totally badass i've got one one more um i forgot your name it's anna hi anna. and thank you so much for uh, i'll be very brief i just wanted to go back to your question uh, your answer a little bit because i think that's amazing um, yeah, so my name is Anagat. I'm founder and CEO of a company called Light Clock. We're developing AI. We're a company started by two women. Uh, we are kind of using our special linguistic skills to tackle natural, natural languages from a new perspective. Um, and I wanted to bring up investment a little bit because we're here and, and it hasn't been brought up. Um, I found this very interesting game theory situation when I talk with investors who are usually male that they are reluctant to start, launch the first investment because they presume that the other male investors down the road will be also reluctant, even though this might just have the, the opposite uh, domino effect. So I found that people actually make extremely counterintuitive um, decisions as investors that serve their worst financial interests because we would make them money just because they think that some other guy will be an idiot uh, that I'm going to meet in one month. Um, and I'm just wondering how, do you have any good um, solutions to that or how to change the language of, of that arena or I'm probably too broad? the best person to answer that question of the, the, of the panel, I think I'm seeing shaking heads. Um, I, I know there's two ways that we can tackle this. One is um, teaching men who are in VCs to understand that the, the stats 
show that women are uh, a better investment. Um, and uh, events like this, we do other events like investing in AI, and there's a lot of awareness. There's also um, taking money from female um, founders um, who have now set up funds like Albright. Um, our friends here at Future Girl Core are helping young women get um, investment. There's a lot of networks, and I will help uh, however I can with your personal plight and anyone else who wants to discuss getting investment as well. Uh, Cognition X is here for you. Um, <laughs> I am, um, uh, and I think that's probably a good time for me to roll to the um, to the poll, which um, I feel like this is the beginning of the drinks discussion. Um, so, over drinks, because I'm going to wrap up in one second. I think um, hopefully you'll have discussions around what you're doing, um, but also what we can do collectively. Um, and before we started, um, uh, yeah, they should have the answers. No, leave it there. No, go to pause. Um, before we started, we looked at which of the following strategies do you feel are most likely to improve gender equality in AI? So we asked people, um, education of girls in STEM earlier, so we've touched on that. AI ethics um, for companies um, to have a board or at least a way for people to put their hands up and say, why the hell is it that way? Um, more women being hired into building AI, promoting positive role models, should we actually have the government regulate um, on things like this? Should we focus our time on educating parents and mothers, um, in particular, based on um, Joanna's point? Um, should we create a better, flexible workforce? So there's many other points. This was our quick brainstorm with the panel. Um, the, the, as you can't see, winning at the moment with 29% is uh, more women hired into building AI because potentially we ask good questions. Um, and that's why I think we've run over a little bit, but I'm going to say um, if we can all give a warm thank you to the panellists. <laughs> um, and have a lovely uh, hour-ish um, hanging out outside and drinking and meeting each other. Thank you all very much. Let's try to log in now.